see. And we're live. Uh, this is The Anglesist. I'm here with Dr. Weisfeld um, on an interview. Please introduce yourself, Doctor. Well, I'm, I am who I am, you know, which is Abraham Weisfeld. I PhD in order to uh, resolve, you know, the big questions that I was presented with all the time in political work and realized that there was no adequate answer. So I had to develop something that did take into consideration what is the uh, identity of national minorities in a, in a uh, secular culture. And uh, that problem is not resolved by liberalism at all. Mm -hmm. So I had to break free of liberalism and Marxism and never even consider the issues. So I had to develop something that was in effect uh, post-Marxist, uh, post but not anti-Marxist, if you know what I mean. Uh, well, I know the sort of um, perspective of your politics, but we'll get onto that a bit later. Um, now that we've done introductions, um, and I, I'm I'm sure that most of the audience is familiar with who Dr. Weisfeld is, seeing as uh, he's been around MRN for quite a while now. But um, thank you for the introduction, Doctor. So, how did you get into politics? Because I I know that you had quite a bit of influence from your parents, who were from uh, Warsaw during World War Two and were Bundists. So yeah. um, tell us a bit more about that. So uh, I didn't really get into politics. I was raised in politics. I was raised, yeah. you know, by a resistance fighter who was my mother, you know, who escaped from the Warsaw Ghetto to join her brother in the forest in Russia to set up a base camp for an underground railway that my mother went back into the Warsaw Ghetto with messages for other people to be able to escape. And uh, then, uh, you know, rescued her uh, her little sister who came with her back uh, into uh, Russian territory of the USSR. And uh, that's where the picture was taken that is on the uh, Facebook, you know, group. Mm. Oh, Jewish you blood. seem to have caught... My mother, you know, that test. Sorry, I, you seem to have there. out a second. Yeah, my, my internet, you know, had a lapse there. It, so it's I'll fine. You can, yeah. Hmm. So my mother raised me, you know, to be a Jewish Bundes socialist. You know, I wasn't, it's not something that I happened to run across, you know, or discover or adopt. It's something that I was actually raised in. So I didn't have to cope with, you know, overcoming uh, any sort of little liberal notions. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. I was raised as, as, as a child of a Jewish uh, resistance fighter who was a refugee, you know, in fact, I was conceived in the refugee camp, you know, in Germany, in Wetzlar, and uh, only born in Toronto thereafter. So uh, I was, you know, born into politics, basically. And my father, he wasn't from Warsaw. He was from another city in Poland, uh, actually a little village, you know, called uh, Bialki, just outside the city, southern city of Lublin, which uh, currently is in Poland. And uh, he wasn't, you know, political like my mother, but he was a pacifist, you know, from a Jewish you know, Orthodox religious beliefs. So he yeah. didn't believe in um, in serving, you know, into a state military, which is what, you know, Zionism is all about. Yeah, so we were, was, um, sorry. Continue. So he was against Zionism as well, you know, for uh, religious uh, reasons, you know, in addition mm -hmm. to my mother who was anti-Zionist, you know, for political reasons based yeah. upon his religion, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna mention that recently you've um, you've wanted to try and apply for a Polish citizenship, and you've had uh, you've had trouble doing it because um, you know the the Jews didn't have documentation in Nazi occupied Poland, oddly enough. Um, yeah. And you were uh, you you were talking about that, and it's sort of a fucking. It's more than just a crime. It's a it's a cultural travesty that Poland uh, continues on this policy. Yeah. Um, just thought it was poignant to mention since we were talking about your parents. Yeah. Well, my parents were obviously Polish. You know, they spoke Polish to each other. You know, mm -hmm. but but uh, uh, I've applied for the recognition of my Polish citizenship. You know, because they passed a law, the law of return. You know, for Jewish refugees. You know, who are Polish. So I applied. Mm -hmm. 
like four years later, they're still considering the matter, you know, because they were complaining that I didn't have passports for my parents. You know, like, how are you supposed to get a passport if you're Jewish, you know, under Nazi occupied Poland? You know, that's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> They okay. didn't want you leaving the country. That was the... No, the Nazis didn't want the Jewish people to escape at all. They wanted, to, you know, everybody to be collected and then, you know, killed off, exterminated, you know. Like it wasn't a matter of getting rid of Jewish people. It was a matter of, of, of exterminating all Jewish people, you know. It was beyond, you know, oh, yeah. the logic of their own position. So, uh, you know, now, you know, like Poland, you know, wants me to prove that my parents were citizens, you know. So I saw showed you know the family register you know handwritten entry of the birth of my father you know in uh in in the village there uh and written in polish you know lettering you know polish alphabet you know like pronunciation of the of the names and all that sort of stuff you know so it's pretty well mm -hmm. proves that they were born there but for the poland you know this is not good enough you know, because for them you know to be a citizen you have to be christian as well yeah and if you're not a Christian, then you belong to something else, you know, which is not Polish, according to their Polish definition. So that's well, this, kind of, you know, the contradiction that I'm faced with. Well, this runs into the general problem of what Western Christianity and Christendom, uh, how that colored the Western world and how that sort of, uh, what how Christian domination became prominent in the regions. First by, obviously, the... Western Roman Catholic Church splitting off from the Orthodox and later Protestantism as a uh, as a ideology. Yes, exactly, precisely. You know, because in the Western, you know, definition of Christianity, you know, like it's the the, the definition of a citizenship in a nation state. The nation state being the problem. And there's only one no, nation. I, so in no, the I East, will say, Christianity sorry. is very integrated. You know, Christianity in the East, in the Orient, mm -hmm. you know, is very integrated into civil society. And is a constituent yeah. of civil society and is not the dominating force in the country like it is in the West. Now, I will say we we uh, should make a distinction between that and the Hegelian nation state concepts, but a lot of them correlate and a lot of them have very similar properties. Um, now, I, I have a religious orientation which is Catholic, but it's. It, it, <laughs> Most people who get into Catholicism who aren't children uh, generally understand the issues of the, the Roman Catholic Church. I think all you need to point out is the fact that the First Reich was the Holy Roman Empire, and it, a lot of it sort of spins off from there. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. But, you know, uh, the kind of Catholicism you're talking about has a national identity to it, you know, like... Yeah. Uh, so that's different, you know, it's part of the fourth world in effect, you know, that uh, doesn't uh, replicate the nation state paradigm. So it's, uh, you know, something yeah. that's not uh, akin to Christian, uh, Catholic, you know, or church domination. And uh, what is dominating, you know, in, in Britain is the Anglican church, you know, that was set up yeah. that is the state religion. The queen is the head of the Anglican church in effect, as well as the head of state. The truth is, is that there is nothing so great and so terrible as the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church can be anything from a, a force of liberation to a horrible, tyrannic plague on the region. And it really depends on what we're talking about, because, you know, there's liberation theology and at the same time, Nazi collaboration. Yeah, yeah. The German Catholic Church, you know, endorsed the uh, Nazi regime and said that uh, Catholics could become a member of the Nazi party, you know, without any sort mm -hmm. of... Uh, without any sanction you know from the catholic church so they endorsed not to mention uh not to mention czechoslovakia um but as well as that there was also the liberation theologists of south america during the uh, 20th century and uh, late 19th century in other regions so yeah. it's, it's really yeah. all perspective and interpretation as most religions are yeah there's also chris hedges you know in the united states you know who's a yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. Chris Hedges, Chris Hedges would be a good example of a genuine uh, democratic socialist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I think we'll. Uh, it's poignant to talk about your political history as well, because you, whilst you are influenced by uh, classical Bundism, you have um, you've been friends with Gaddafi uh, and confidants with Gaddafi. You've been um, you've uh, talked with Yasser Arafat and you've uh, been deeply involved with Palestine. So all of these things will obviously 
uh, affect and shift your uh, political position, which has informed your work. So um, yeah. if you'd like to go into detail with that, I'd be very interested. Yes. Uh, at about 16, I wanted to get involved in political work, you know, because I realized that, you know, there's no uh, no individual defense against uh, discrimination and uh, anti-Semitism and uh, and uh, fascism. In effect, there's no single solution mm -hmm. you know, on an individual basis. You know, it has to be a collective, you know, effort that has to be engaged in. So I went to find, you know, some other people to work with. So uh, I heard about a meeting of uh, of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, you know, in Toronto. Yeah, yeah. So I went to find it, you know, but I couldn't find it. Then uh, I went to the uh, Social Democratic uh, Youth uh, Movement, the uh, NDY, New Democratic Youth uh, of Ontario. And there I, I became an organizer and uh, started to build up a whole, you know, um, youth movement, you know, for the, uh, for the uh, New Democratic Party, as it's called in Canada, of the Second International. And uh, I was doing very well, you know, but I, was, I met um, the uh, revolutionaries inside the New Democratic Youth. Yeah. who were uh, Trotskyists, you know. Uh, there were also Communist Party members who had, you know, infiltrated into into the uh, New Democratic Youth. Uh, but, uh, you know, each had their own sort of faction, <laughs> you know, even though it was supposedly illegal for them to be a member of another political party. I wasn't really a member of another political party. I was a member of a, of a youth movement, you know. <laughs> it wasn't a political party yeah. in and of itself. But nonetheless, they used it to to expel me in 1970 because they found it convenient to make that accusation against me because the problem with me was that I was supporting Palestine. They didn't want to hear about that because the Second International was solidly pro-Zionist, pro-Israel. So, and they mm -hmm. couldn't get rid of me for that reason because that would have made a scandal because I'm Jewish, I have a Jewish name and all that. So, you know, they expelled me on the excuse, you know, that I was a member of a, a Trotskyist uh, party, even though I wasn't. The, the Trotskyist party that was the affiliate of the Fourth International the Canadian section was called the LSA, League for Socialist Action. So after being spelled, you know, I, I ended up joining the, the LSA because there was a big international debate between the uh, GMR, uh, which was another Trotskyist party that formed, you know, under the leadership of Ernest Mandel in Paris and Alain Crevine, who was another faction in the Fourth International. So they fused under pressure from both the United States and the and the French uh, parties, and uh, so all of a sudden, you know, we we you know, we met a whole bunch of other Trotskyists who were more radical, <laughs> called the inside, you know, in the fused uh, formation, and, and we had a big debate about the student movement, which you know the sectarians of both you know factions you know couldn't easily accept, but I supported the student movement document, which said that students could be a revolutionary force. What um what what what, what year would this be? Uh, just curious. This is uh 67, 67, 67, 68 debate, big international debate in the fourth international, yeah, yeah. very important. And all those documents, you know, like are internal, they're they haven't been published. You know, I had copies, but but I, I threw them away because they were too heavy to carry. <laughs> so I they, mean, um well well the new left um in America um was I mean the new left in America was comprised of a lot of organizations as well as uh, in thingy in in Canada in England the, there was a very heavy uh, Trotskyist uh, tint of the new left. Um, yes, the, the relationship between the Canadian and the uh, British uh, Trotskyist movement because of uh, Ernie Tate who went and organized yeah. you know who was organizing both sections at the same time. I knew him, you know, he just died recently, but. Uh, after that, uh, I got expelled from the Social Democratic Party in 1970. So mm -hmm. then I was more into Vietnam work, you know, Vietnam as well. You know, the NDP, the Social Democratic Party, didn't want to support, you know, v Vietnamese self-determination because uh, it was the Communist Party uh, of, the, of North Vietnam that was leading that struggle. And so they didn't want yeah. to identify, you know, with the Communist Party. So because there was a big hysteria here, you know, like... Uh, if uh, the uh, Vietnamese communists were going to win, then China was going to sweep, the, you know, throughout all of Asia, and that would be the end of, you know, civilization, supposedly. That was the line at the time. <laughs> and, and as well, you know, like, I mean, the, there was still the Red Panic going on and stuff, and people um, it, people supporting uh, Vietnam would definitely be identified as pinkos and stuff. 
Um, oh, yeah. There was a lot of profiling, even for people who weren't directly communist. Uh, yeah. Obviously, this doesn't excuse the Social Democratic Party. I'm just saying that like, it doesn't surprise me at that time. The Social Democratic Party was obviously wrong not to support the fucking Vietnamese struggle for, for independence. Yeah, so they were the pinkos denouncing the Reds and expelling the Reds and the Trotskyists. And, but they left yeah. the Communist Party, stay inside. <laughs> the Communist Party was very cooperative with the leadership. And they finger pointed. Oh, wow, what a surprise. You know, so. <laughs> it's so ironic. But uh, after that, you know, uh, because of the sectarianism in the Fourth International, there was a group of us, you know, who who were two other, you know, uh, Jewish um, Holocaust refugee survivors, uh, Harry Capito, who became a lawyer, and Gord Doctorow, who was uh, a teacher. And uh, we, together with others, you know, like uh, Wayne Roberts, who was an academic, you know, who was a Fulbright scholar, um, uh, we formed another faction of 18, together with the founder of, of post-World War II Trotskyism, Ross Dowson, the leader of the Trotsky movement, mm -hmm. came with us as well, and we quit. We resigned, you know, from the Fourth International, put out a document called Against Sectarianism and uh, talked about, you know, how to form United Fronts, you know, with other uh, organizations. And uh, uh, it was very, you know, enlightening. And, and we started, you know, being very active, produced the paper that we can hand it out for free instead of selling it like the Trotskyists and the Communist Party. So our circulation increased uh, to 5,000 a month uh, mm -hmm. just in, in Toronto alone. And then I became an uh, organizer. Uh, well, first of all, I was invited to, to start teaching, you know, a political theory at uh, York University because I started my doctoral studies there um, after quitting, you know, pure sciences because of the military uh, funding of, uh, of research at Canadian universities. So I went to political science in graduate school, was started my PhD, and I was teaching at York University in political theory and uh, the political economy of Canada-U.S. relations and dependency theory, together with the new left, you know, who are situated there. They formed a left nationalist school of thought. So I was off on my own, and uh, and uh, then I, I, I took a, a sabbatical year off of uh, studies, you know, in order to become organizer. I was elected organizer of the, in, of the new group called Socialist League, you know, putting in a, um, a forward paper. That's where my history is, you know, in Toronto. And, uh, but, you know, the others, you know, wouldn't, you know, follow, wouldn't, you know, really sort of support me in my initiatives, you know, inside the group as well. And I was sort of, you know, so considered to be an illegitimate, you know, like spokesperson for the working class. And so I couldn't, I wasn't really considered to be a suitable organizer because of mm -hmm. uh, my name, you know, and they, and this, uh, this, this, uh, this other guy, you know, with a British name, you know, was favored by many of the people there. So I got fed up with that kind of, you know, discrimination. Mm. I quit that organization as well, went off on my own. And then uh, I was invited to come and work in the Palestine embassy in Ottawa by the ambassador, Abdul, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, because of the war broke out in 1982. And uh, I was, you know, to the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, and known to Yasser Arafat because in 1980, I was uh, head of a delegation from Canada that uh, went to Beirut, Lebanon, in order to meet, you know, with the PLO. And we each, you know, met with uh, Yasser Arafat. Yeah. So that story is that we met at, you know, like three o'clock in the morning. In the morning, he, you know, he worked at night. And, uh, but we had a disagreement, you know, like right away, you know, as uh, he knew about my work in the brochure that we had produced in Toronto called the Alliance of Non-Science Jews. And, uh, he, he was very friendly, you know, at first, you know, very yeah. genial, you know, with sloppy kisses at first, you know. And then he said to me, you know, like, so happy, you know, to meet me that he said, you know, do you have a question? You know, so I got to ask you, Yasser Arafat, you know, any questions I wanted. So the best question I thought of, you know, asking him, you know, was for a message, you know, for the Jewish people that I could take back with me and then transmit, you know, to to uh, to Jewish assemblies and such, you know. So I figured it would be a good organizing, you know, initiative. But he freaked out yeah. because I used the term Jewish people because he had only known that term to be used by the Zionists because the, I see. Official, you know, the official Marxist, you know, leftist position was that the Jewish people were not a people. The Jewish people were an ethnic minority or a religious minority uh, that were to be assimilated into secular society. That was the line, you know, 
that was the line in USSR, you know, synagogues were prohibited. Um, and, uh, but anti-Semitism was um, prohibited as well in the USSR. My father told me stories about, you know, how uh, anti-Semites were actually arrested and put into prison, you know, for, for, for their racism. But yeah. at the same time, he was discriminated against, you know, because he was just a Jewish refugee, you know. And uh, he ended in, up being... in general, there was like religious discrimination in certain periods of the USSR. It did soften eventually, but especially during the uh, early and middle periods, it was definitely there. Yeah. But, you know, anti-Semitism, you know, was an issue in the USSR in, in both ways, you know, like it was prohibited. It was suppressed, but it was used by the bureaucracy later on, you know, in accusing certain people of uh, being uh, outside of the leadership core. So, you know, a very complicated, you know, story in the USSR. And uh, its limitations were, were preset, you know, by the nation. Here's a question that was here, which becomes a constitutional question as well. And uh, so this is what I began to work on, you know, in my doctoral work, you know, and I, I wasn't allowed to continue with my doctoral work at the York University. The liberals, you know, stopped me and the Marxists, you know, weren't happy with me either to sort of stick their necks out, you know, to support me because I wasn't supporting their position. So after uh, the uh, war ended in 1985 and after writing, you know, the first book on the Sabra Shatila massacre as a documentary study, yeah. Then I went to Montreal to go to the most progressive new university uh, in Quebec called the University de Quebec and Montréal, which was whole, part of the whole, you know, Quebecois revolution, the uh, yeah. quiet revolution, as it was called. So they set up <clears throat> universities that were free of the uh, Liberal Party ideology. And <clears throat> that's where they accepted me to continue doing my doctoral work. And then I worked on uh, doing critique of the nation state starting with Hegel and starting with the Torah, you know, the Old Testament, so-called. So, -called. so uh, it, uh, it, I was, uh, had a uh, European Swiss professor as a thesis director who required me to do a comprehensive examination of European political philosophy, European thesis. So I worked on that for eight years while I will, actually. And mm then uh, went through a second jury that required me to do major and minor modifications and finally, you know, finished the thesis of more than 700 pages that was finally accepted by defense. And then I got the, uh, I got the accreditation, you know, for the uh, PhD uh, in a big struggle, revolutionary struggle. I took, to to court, oh, it you know, took to years to, it wasn't, I forget what year you actually managed to get it, but um, what, what year did you actually got, get your PhD? 2014 yeah yeah when did you first apply to get it oh i started the writing the thesis in about uh 1995 i guess fuck me almost that's almost 20 years i think wait no yeah that's almost 20 years i think well, together with the coursework, yeah, about 20 years to do a doctoral thesis. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Um, one second, Doctor. I'm I'm going to head off to the, the toilet a second, but um, if okay, you we, would, uh, uh, would you, uh, could you describe your uh, political relationship with uh, Muammar Gaddafi? Ah, yes. Okay. Okay, I'll get into that. So, uh, you know, when I was in... Uh, pioneer Jewish anti-Zionist activists, you know, in helping to form the Toronto uh, <clears throat> uh, Alliance of Non-Zionist Jews. Uh, and uh, not only did Yasser Arafat hear of me, but, you know, uh, Gaddafi also heard about me. So uh, I was invited to a conference in 1976 in Tripoli, which was under blockade at the time, you know, sanctions and boycott and blockade uh, against Libya. And uh, so I went, you know, uh, and uh, they provided me an open ticket that I was able to use, you know, to bounce around for a while, you know, to meet up with people. <clears throat> and then in order to get into Tripoli, I had to go through uh, its neighbor, you know, in Tunisia. So I went to uh, 
um, uh, Carthage, uh, uh, mm. and then uh, transited there with another airplane to uh, Jerba, an island off the coast of uh, Tunisia, and then from there with a bus, you know, to the frontier with Libya, and from there I got a a ride, you know, with uh, Libyan police. They came and picked me up from the border with Tunisia, and they brought me to Tripoli to the conference. And then I was a bit late. And then I got to speak, and I think uh, Gaddafi's son, uh, Sayyid Al Islam Al Gaddafi, uh, heard me at that time when I spoke about um, the Jewish anti-Zionism. And that speech, you know, was copied uh, by the uh, conference and printed up, mimeographed at that time. It was mimeographing, and uh, Would, uh... I put. Uh, would copies there be a of that link to that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a link to you know academia.edu, and it's also uh, published in the book, uh, the, uh, the uh, second edition of the uh, book, which is now published in both Arabic and in English, called the Federation of Palestinian and Hebrew Nations. So I'll find it on edu in a second. So there should be a Libya should be able to. Uh, provide a search mechanism to find that piece. So then I came back to Libya in 1986 when I was started to work with the revolutionary committees, which was the like international of uh, the Libyan revolution. Libya decided to go, you know, extend the revolution to the international, the international scene. And they were supporting revolutionary movements. And <clears throat> I was uh, an organizer for the revolutionary committee movement in North America. There wasn't anybody in the United States to do that, so I had to be responsible for both Canada and the United States. <clears throat> and then even in South America, I was invited to speak in Caracas, you know, on behalf of the of the uh, Revolutionary Committee movement at a conference there on direct democracy in Caracas. And I uh, and uh, and uh, but uh, Jamal, who was the organizer of the International Revolutionary Committee movement, you know. He died soon after that, you know, and supposedly in a car crash. He may have been assassinated. So that was a problem. And then in 1996, you know, I came back to, uh, to Tripoli again, you know, after the uh, bombing of the Gaddafi home by the United States. And we came there, you know, to mm -hmm. demonstrate in solidarity, you know, with, uh, with the Green Movement. And uh, thereafter, there was another uh, conference uh, that uh, I was... Uh, uh, organizing for, but it became a, you know, it, it collapsed. The whole conference collapsed because there was, uh, there was uh, some fascists uh, who pretended to be supporters of uh, the Green Movement who came mm. from Toronto. So we called for the expulsion and then the Libyans uh, resisted that at first because they wanted to have their support. And then finally they were expelled, you know, after the Black Panther, Black Panther Party members, you know, from the United States who were at the conference said that if the fascists, you know, were not expelled from the conference, that they would kill them, assassinate them. So Libya, you know, finally got rid of them. But then, you know, it was, you know, too late. You know, most of the conference was, you know, <clears throat> just a debate on whether or not to accept their support or not. So, uh, unfortunately, during... Uh, ...Sherman family... One of the, I'll repeat that because I think there was a lapse. One yeah, the, yeah, uh, it, did, from, it did. Yeah, one of the journalists from Ottawa, who was from a German family, uh, he couldn't, you know, take, you know, being uh, mixed in with, you know, fascists at the same conference, and so he committed suicide. And this was blamed on Libya, and he was a, you, Libya Q, was accused of assassinating this journalist in order to prevent him from reporting about the presence of the fascists, even though everybody else knew already. And it was being reported on by anybody else. So that conference failed. And then uh, Gaddafi and the Green Movement uh, under Gaddafi made a turn towards a what's called a brown red coalition. So they started you know, oh. working. Yeah. So it started working, you know, with the uh, with fascists, you know, in Europe, you know, who pretended to be supporters of the Green Movement in Libya. And uh, then uh, Gaddafi turned away from me and started working with uh, Gilad Altsman, who was part of the uh, European fascist movement. So I was disinvited, you know, from an organizing committee of a conference in Europe on uh, Palestine, you know, which 
they took my whole list, you know, of Jewish, you know, anti-Zionist, you know, activists, used that and and um, invited Gilad Altsman instead of me. But that conference broke down as well, you know, because Uri Davis, you know, Dr. Uri Davis from Israel, you know, re refused to accept, you know, Gilad, Gilad Altsman, you know, as a co-delegate to the conference. And that conference broke down again. And uh, Libya, you know, shot itself in the foot, you know, as a result. And... Uh, now, this is not to so, say what the rebels you know, did to that country is justified, but yeah, there was serious degeneration on Gaddafi's behalf towards the end. Oh, yeah, Gaddafi became... Uh, it's, it, but the, it wasn't just at the end, you know, like, because 1973, you know, Gaddafi, you know, in public, oh, yeah. you know, from the roof of the of, uh, of, of one of the parliament buildings or something like that there, he tore up the old constitution of King Idris and promised that there would be a new constitution, but there never was. There never was a constitutional process, never was a constituent assembly. But, you know, he set up the you know, revolutionary committees, which were Gaddafi supporters who were, you know, placed into the various, you know, positions of power in order to control, you know, the economy and the politics of Libya. So it be, even though each revolutionary committee was autonomous and could have a position which differed, you know, from Gaddafi's, nonetheless, you know, it was still, you know, like, sort of a semi-party, you know, formation that was still infiltrating into this, you know, superstructure of civil society. Which is interesting seeing as he had such a critique of uh, party governments. Yeah, he critiqued party building, you know, party formations and all that. But, and so banned and parties, but, uh, and they set up, you know, revolutionary committees, which were supposed to be each autonomous from each other, you know, but it really didn't work out. In so. function, they acted like parties. In effect, it acted like the party, yeah, and uh, and people I think were afraid of taking a different position, you know, because they would lose funding, because funding mm -hmm. was controlled, you know, like uh, the Saif al Islam al Gaddafi, you know, was installed as the head of the uh, infrastructure of the country, you know, so all the revenue from the infrastructure, uh, electricity, you know, uh, all that sort of stuff, um, you know, the uh, water system, you know, with the great underground, you know, river. Uh, all that, you know, the revenues, you know, from the from oil, basically, which paid for it all, were centrally, I would repeat, you know, that the economy was centrally controlled. And uh, so eventually that, you know, to political centralization as well. There was no apparatus set up, yeah. you know, to control the uh, the day-to-day -day workings of the country. I will, but I did um... meet Gaddafi one time. I met Gaddafi one time before things degenerated. And he liked, you know, the book yeah. that I had published in 1989. This one here, I'll show it to you. It has a, I put a green cover on it in, in order to uh, show solidarity with the revolutionary green committees. And wow. this is published by Polarity Press, you know, the black press in Atlanta, Georgia, the end of Zionism. And I was working with um, uh, Dr. Cly Yusuf Klai, who was a Canadian uh, a black academic, you know, who wrote about national uh, cultural autonomy in legal terms. He was a lawyer and he worked for the United Nations. And he set up a whole theory of uh, how a constitution could accommodate, you know, national minority relations in a, in a federated society. So uh, this book, you know, I, I, I handed to Gaddafi and mm -hmm. uh, he my work you know as being legitimate and after that i was a spokesperson you know to go and i spoke in bonn germany on behalf of the green movement in caracas venezuela in uh, yeah. new york at uh, at uh, uh, cornell uh what is it called cornell university yeah you know united states you know had the diplomatic relations with you know libya finally and when, and Gaddafi actually tried you know to become friendly with the west in order to avert you know what happened to Saddam Hussein? Uh, you know, he was particularly uh, afraid of being assassinated. So, yeah. you know, there was a conference in, in New York, you know, setting up diplomatic relations with the ambassador, you know, Dennis Ross, who spoke at that time. And I confronted him with a question about Palestine. So I said to him, you know, like, if the United States can recognize and have diplomatic relations, you know, with Libya, why can't it do the same you know, with Palestine and recognize, you know, the Palestine? Mm -hmm. Yellow as the government, you know, of, of uh, independent Palestine and require the military withdrawal of Israel from the occupied territories in Gaza, at least. So he freaked out on me, you know, he went on for 
for like 20 minutes, you know, giving his rationalizations. I confronted him once more again in a, in a webinar and uh, reminded him of that. And, uh, he still had no adequate answers, <clears throat> referring to the 1947 partition agreement and uh, saying that uh, this was not accepted by the Palestinians and, and, uh, and the uh, Arab armies, you know, attacked Israel. But I pointed out to him, you know, the, <laughs> the Zionist militia had attacked uh, in Palestine uh, outside of the uh, frontier set by the partition plan. And a year later, the Arab <laughs> army you know, intervened, you know, to finally stop, you know, the Zionist militias from advancing. And he had no answer to that at all. So. They have continually affronted the original accords of the partition, even though the partition itself is an unethical thing. They have broken their own rules, in effect. Yeah, I mean, the partition plan wasn't fair, you know, but you know, it was something that the Palestinians were willing to negotiate around, but the, not the Zionists. They attacked right away. But um, I would like to um, just so every what would you say are the main principles, policies, and philosophy of Bundism? Now, obviously, this is a large question, but for people who haven't read any Bundist literature or haven't um watched any videos from you or any of the other members of the Bundist movement, what would you, um, and the larger Bundist sphere, what would you uh, say the main points of Bundism are? The most important point about Bundism, the principle of Bundism, is that it is independent of the state. That's the big difference, you know, from the, uh, from the communist and the social democratic parties. Yeah. It's independent of the state. So it's not calling for the for the taking over of the state. It's not calling for the capturing of the state. It is not calling for the installation of a revolutionary workers' government, you know, to, to manage the state. No, it is calling for the abolition of the state, which makes it similar to the anarchists, but anarchism has no recognition of civil society. You know, anarchism is basically, basically you know, uh, radical liberalism, you know, recognize the individual as the sovereign entity rather than the state, like as in Sorel. So it's a very individualistic. Whereas Bundism recognizes, you know, cultural collectivities. The the first one for Bundism being, you know, the Jewish nationality. Nationality mm -hmm. becomes a term rather than ethnicity or nash or minority or cultural minority or religious minority. These are all liberal terms. Bundism talks about national identity, not religious identity. A Jewish national identity includes a religious identity as well, but it is, in 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 uh, social terms, a national minority. And the Bund, you know, was calling for recognition of such a national minority as the Jewish people, nowadays called the fourth world, the national minorities within the first world, and uh, such yeah. national minorities are to be recognized as having the national right to self-determination. Self-determination becomes applied to a nation and not to a state. Okay? Yeah. This is the big difference. Yeah, basically. Which uh, leads on to the topic of um, the Hegelian nation state. However, what I think we'll go over first is the, uh, the fact that your position on Palestine is that a, uh, a two-state solution is uh, un unconscionable and you also disagree with the idea of a one-state solution. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Mm. Yes. Um, the problem with uh, state solutions of one or another, one sort or another, you know, either two-state or one-state, you know, solution, is that you're talking about the separation of peoples. Yeah. You know, if there was a two-state solution, then presumably the Zionists would, say, Zionists would say then that the Palestinians living within the Israel state should leave and they should go to the Palestine state because they're Palestinians. And the Palestinians could say equally, well, look what you're doing, you know, expelling the Palestinians. So we're going to expel all of the Israelis, you know, whether, whether, whether they're, uh, uh, they can be considered acceptable or not. So, mm. so you know, that would be a separation of peoples, which is one, which is understanding in which was opposed by Gandhi. Gandhi was proposing something like a federated state, but he had no national model. He had no mechanism by which to implement it. And so it split apart. And, and India with millions dead, you know, millions, you know, refugees, you know, on both sides. And the same thing would apply, you know, to two-state to, to solution, you know, uh, in, in, uh, in Palestine. 
um, if there wasn't a, you know, a transfer of population from one side to the other in a two-state solution, then the national minority remaining within each of the states would be considered you know, a second-class status and would be treated as such, as you know, the Palestinians are being treated you know, within Israel proper right now. Yes. So it's not a solution, even though it calls itself a solution. Now, one-state solution you know, would, you know, based upon liberal ideology, which it doesn't acknowledge, it's a liberal solution. It would, you know, be giving every individual a, a citizenship status, an equal citizenship status. There would be no national identity. So there wouldn't be, you know, like Israelis or Palestinians or, or Hebrews anymore. You know, just be individual, you know, members of, you know, a, uh, of a state, a common state, and uh, presumably, you know, with two uh, languages. And uh, then uh, what would happen? In such a situation, okay, because we're talking about a certain context, and the context includes the Palestinian refugees, which are living in refugee camps still in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, and in Jordan. Yeah. Jordan has two million Palestinian refugees. Okay, so are the refugees supposed to come back? And if not, why not? You know, so one state solution doesn't address that. If the Palestinians come back, and they form like two thirds of the population because there's seven million Palestinian refugees now. The uh, six million or so Palestinians residing in the territory historic of Palestine right away. So that you know gives you thirteen million compared to the uh, six million you know Jewish Israelis that are there. So the Jewish Israelis would become a minority in such a case if there was a right of return for the refugees. Now, would you know, the um, uh, Israelis, you know, uh, Jewish Israelis who are educated to be Zionists since birth, would they accept that? No, because they knew that they would be, you know, like uh, put back in the same position that, that the Jewish minorities held in the Ottoman Empire, which was uh, uh, a milis uh, status, it's called, in which a national minority doesn't have the same rights as the majority of the population. Now, since they have, you know, military control, economic control, and political control, do you think they're going to give up their political control, economic con control, and military control and become a national minority in an Ottoman Never. Empire type of situation? Never. So it would degenerate into a civil war. So it's not a solution in and of itself. It would be the same okay. as it is now, essentially, because there cannot be... Uh, because there, there is no way that the Israelis will ever reconcile rec reconcile into a state that domin is dominated by Palestinians. Now, this is not to say that you think that there is any country in the world that should be called Israel. Israel is not the name of a, a state. It is the name of a Jewish people. That's right. Yes. Originally, uh, you know, Israel is the name of a Jewish people. And uh, uh, it wasn't associated with a land. You know, the, the term Eretz Yisrael which means the land of Israel, it became uh, something that was introduced later on and embellished, you know, more so by Protestantism, which, you know, mm. talked about, you know, uh, duplicating, you know, what was supposedly, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the state, you know, of uh, King David and King Solomon, which broke up actually, you know, it wasn't stable and developed, you know, into the, uh, the two territories of Samaria and Judea. Mm. which gave rise to the term Jewish. So, um, uh, so you know, neither, you know, two-state solution or one-state solution are solutions because they are based upon the state. And the problem is Hegel, as you mentioned. So what to do? Now, um, you know, you can't uh, jump into something, you know, new without a transitional program. So the book, The Federation of Palestinian and Hebrew Nations, begins with, what is necessary, which is the recognition of the Palestine state, not as part of a two-state solution, but as part of a process in which uh, uh, the uh, Palestine state, which is about to be recognized by the General Assembly, actually, mm. it is already recognized by the state of the General Assembly, and it's now going to be given a vote with equal rights, it will be able now to negotiate on behalf of the Palestinian people and the Palestinian refugees because the PLO has never given up on the Palestinian refugees. They consider themselves to be the representative, the political representatives of the Palestinians 
at large, whether under occupation in the West Bank or Gaza or internationally. So they will uh, get to negotiate and uh, uh, there will be a, a, se a settlement imposed uh, upon Israel to withdraw from the West Bank by the United Nations eventually. Okay, how? One mechanism would be uh, externally and the other mechanism would be internally. The internal mechanism would be a Jewish revolution against Zionism, which the Jewish people would force Israel to withdraw from the West Bank. The external mechanism would be the General Assembly would uh, call for, uh, has already called for the withdrawal of Israel uh, military occupation of the West Bank and siege around Gaza. Um, and uh, this would then form a, a Security Council resolution calling for the withdrawal of uh, Israel from the West Bank, etc. And then it would be uh, vetoed by the uh, United States, but not necessarily. You know, even Biden has called for the recognition of the Palestine state, but they have preconditions. And these preconditions are set up by the ambassador, Dennis Ross, the one that I was debating. Uh, twice in conference, and they call for Israel to the they call for the Palestinians to recognize Israel as a Jewish nation state, you know, entrenching you know uh, um, Zionist the you know, idea privileges. Of Israel. Yeah, so um, the Security Council resolution, you know, would not recognize Israel as a Jewish nation state because it would uh, negate you know the rights to the self determination of the Palestinians as a result. So they couldn't. So the Security Council, you know, would take it up, you know, if the United States veto such a resolution, then there's a mechanism to overcome that veto, which is a mechanism that the United States introduced itself into the General Assembly when they didn't want, you know, the Soviet Union to have a veto over the United Nations proceedings. It's never been used, but it works like this. The resolution would go back to the General Assembly and the General Assembly would choose to overrule the Security Council, but could only do so by a two-thirds majority, not a simple majority. It would have to be a two-thirds yeah. majority. Okay. Now, that's never been achieved. And, you know, even abstentions, you know, uh, would be counted as like a counter vote. You know, it has to be an absolute two-thirds majority of all, you know, General Assembly members. That's now, it's getting close to that. Yeah, it could happen, you know. So... That would, uh, you know, be one, another mechanism by which, you know, Israel would be forced to withdraw from the military occupation of the West Bank. Now, after, you know, the United Nations General Assembly overrules the Security Council, then what happens? How does it actually implement the resolution? So they set up a UN peacekeeping force. Mm. So, you know, the UN would send peacekeeping forces, in, you know, in to the uh, occupied West Bank through Jordan. Now, if Israel wanted to stop, you know, UN peacekeeping forces from coming into the West Bank, you know, by way of Jordan, because they have control of the frontier with Jordan. When I go into Jordan, I have to pass through both, you know, the Israel frontier and the Jordan frontier. There's two, you know, uh, places where you have to uh, show your identity. So, uh, you know, then there would be confrontation with the UN peacekeeping forces and Israel would eventually have to back down. So, uh, you know, there are ways in order to, you know, to end the military occupation. Once that's done, there is provision in the uh, Resolution 181, which is the partition resolution in the United Nations, for uh, individuals to choose their citizenship whether, irrespective of where they're living. So this provision allows for the integration, the interpenetration of the, of the, uh, of the demographics. Uh, and and uh, so Palestinians living in, within Israel proper would choose to become Palestinian citizens and they would vote in the Palestinian elections. And then those uh, uh, Israel colonialists, you know, who are living in the West Bank, You you know, out main, you know, there would be a confederation of uh, Israel and Palestine in which the economy would divide it up, you know, along uh, national lines in which, you know, each uh, government would begin to rule the uh, its own citizens, irrespective of where they were living in the territory, in the given territory. So that begins, you know, uh, demographic integration and territorial integration. Next, 
you would move into a federation with a federal council uh, from the confederation. A confederation is something that we've actually started online in which there would be a common government, but without a state that would be governing both uh, territories and, and both states. And the common issues, you know, would have to be agreed upon in which each, you know, party, each government, you know, would have a veto in the matter. So eventually they would develop a common economic policy, common uh, uh, policy on, uh, on other things, you know, like airports and um, passageways and, and stuff like that. So it'd be a slow process, a transitional process following a transitional program in which eventually there would be integration into a federation in which each nation would follow the Bundes principle of national cultural autonomy in which, you know, the Hebrew nation, who are the Israelis, the Jewish Israelis, would have their own government. The Palestinians uh, would have their national cultural autonomy as well, their own government, irrespective of where they're living. And, uh, and uh, you know, there would be a federal council in which each would have, you know, 50 percent. So, by video labs here again. Okay, then there would have yeah. a resolution of various, you know, questions like property rights. Property rights would have to go to a judicial council. And I have outlined, you know, like uh, a council that uh, a tribunal that would determine, you know, who is the owner, owner, owner of a given piece of land or a house. You know, the Palestinians mm -hmm. that could apply with their documentation from the Ottoman Empire as to be the original owners. And then the court, you know, would have to decide in favor of the Palestinians, return their lands to them. And then if the uh, Israelis, you know, wanted to keep on living, you know, in the West Bank, they'd have to prove that the land on which they're living, you know, is, is legally occupied. They'd have to pay, you know, uh, if they wanted to buy the land, but they couldn't just, you know, take private Palestinian lands, you know, that would be, you know, refused, you know, by tribunal. That would be composed of three judges, okay? One Israeli judge chosen by the Israeli government or elected by, you know, Israeli uh, a Hebrew civil society, Palestinian judge. And the first two judges choose a third judge that was uh, cons be a consensual agreement between the first two judges and could be an international judge as well. Then the three judges would have to come come to a consensual decision on what to do you know, with the property rights and the human rights as well. So that's the mechanism, you know, that's the whole program outlined in the book on how to make a transition uh, from the current think... occupation to a federation. I think the term Hebrew civil society makes more sense than using the term Israeli or Israel just because of the connotation. But I understand what you're talking about in terms of in terms of system, yeah. in terms of the decolonialization. I don't think uh, Palestinians yeah. would be OK with anything <laughs> called Israel and yeah. um, having to deal yeah, with no the way. civil society. Because you, uh, yeah, no. you said you, you also said yourself that Palestine is one of the. Um, what one of the places that you've been that that sort of confirmed that you that a pacifistic route to um a, a pacifistic route to po politics is not always applicable, especially in a Palestinian context. That there did have to that uh, there has to be armed struggle in that context. Um, okay, a very uh, sensitive topic in the topic. Uh, well, that's why uh, I will avoid going into detail because this is YouTube, but. We, yeah, it's because I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go back there, you know, and I can be uh, uh, arrested for supporting any illegal actions. Oh, I don't obviously. support illegal actions per se. I support um, self resistance, but resistance, you know, takes many forms. There's of the course. peaceful uh, resistance, the uh, popular resistance committees, which I participate in. So I go out onto the demonstrations, you know, to, to. Uh, uh, demonstrate that Palestinians uh, uh, retain uh, uh, legal rights, you know, to the Jordan Valley by walking down a valley. And then, you know, the military comes and says, what are you doing here? You know, you can't be here. And says, yes, we can. You know, this is uh, Palestinian territory. And it is because it hasn't even been legally annexed, you know, by the Israel government because they haven't been able to do so. Not even Netanyahu has been able to annex the, the Jordan River Valley, you know, because uh, of opposition, even from the United States. So, that's, you know, like uh, resistance, you know, peaceful resistance. Then there's other forms of resistance. But um, resistance has to be uh, something which is defensive. You know, if there's military incursions, you know, then, then uh, military incursions which are illegal under uh, 
even the Oslo Agreement, because, you know, Sector A is supposed to be under the Palestinian control. But every night, you know, the military comes into Nablus, the city of Nablus, and to arrest people that they choose. You know, this is illegal, even under the Oslo Agreement. You know, it can be resisted, and it is being resisted. Yeah. Now, there's battles, you know, happen with the, <clears throat> the uh, uh, forces, you know, armed forces, you know, in Nablus against, you know, uh, Israel military incursions to arrest people. Yeah. And uh, this began in Janine, and they have, uh, I think it's brigade, they call it the Janine Brigade, you know, which is composed of, you know, fighters from various political parties altogether, like the uh, popular resistance committees, which include, you know, all the different political parties involved, you know, there was, and the, you know, the political parties are not even discussed, you know, because everybody's just doing, you know, common resistance, you know, it's a common struggle. So, same thing in the brigades. Now there is a Nablus Brigade, which is an armed brigade, which is fighting against, you know, the military incursions into Nablus city itself, which is a major city. Now, other than that, one can talk about uh, uh, resistance uh, to um, impede the, uh, the economic and uh, political functioning, you know, of the Zionist state. So there's BDS, boycott of its disinvestment, and, and sanctions. This yeah. can be applied in Turkey as well and be uh, and, and extended in many, in many other ways to uh, actually become much more effective than it is now. So, uh, but the point is that resistance does not involve, you know, targeting civilians. Targeting of oh, civilians okay. is not resistance. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Israel that, tries to make out crime. Resistance is targeting or threatening, you know, civilians, but that's not the case. Uh, when, uh, Settlers are being resisted. The settlers uh, are usually attacking and are armed themselves uh, and they're allowed to attack, you know, by the Israel military occupation, whereas uh, any Palestinian resistance against the attacking, you know, <clears throat> Zionist settlers is met with force by the military. So as, as all we, of that are, as we can, sorry, but as we can see from that, most of the uh, videos, uh, sorry. As we can see yes, from most the videos, sorry. Yes, like the videos that you presented that I've made, you know, as well, demonstrate, you know, that we are resisting, you know, against a military force, not against mm -hmm. civilians. Yeah, there, there are very, there are no videos that you will find that target anything close to civilian targets. I mean, it, any, any attempt that has been happened to even, even come close to that was mostly to, well, not even mostly, was towards military and police. And mm. as mm. we saw from what happened when uh, the Alaska Mosque uh, was attacked and the recompense for that, you saw what the Iron Dome looked like in action. Um, the, the, the vastly expensive and American-funded uh, defense system uh, currently piloted by uh, the Israeli government. There's something very important there that is not known that I, I should uh, point out. You know, if we're talking about resistance, let's talk about Gaza as well, not just the West Bank. Yes. Okay. When the Gaza, you know, uh, Hamas or Islamic Jihad, you know, fire what's called rockets into. They aren't rockets. To Israel, you know, uh, settlements which are actually settlements around Gaza, which are on Gaza territory, because yeah. Gaza was much larger before you know, than it is now. So they're on territory that, you know, actually belongs to Gaza. But they're nonetheless, you know, civilian territories, civilian villages that are being targeted, which is an error. They should be targeting military targets, you know, if they're going to target, you know, uh, rockets somewhere. But these However, rockets are not actually rockets. They're, they're not even rockets. They're not, yes, they are at the scale of a mortar, you know, they're very small. And furthermore, which is more important, they don't have any explosive charge. No. They don't have a bomb, you know, they're just like flying pipes. So why have no Israelis been killed because of these attacks? Because there's no explosive charge. No. I mean, they could, you know, cause damage to a roof, you know, and they could land on somebody's head, you know, but it hasn't happened, you know. By chance, you know, but there is no plus. And the reason why there's no explosive charge is because they don't have any explosives, you know, in Gaza. Because Gaza is, uh, is under siege. You know, anything coming into Gaza is controlled by either Israel 
or by Egypt. Egypt is also putting Gaza under siege, you know, with the um, uh, Sisi government uh, uh, now, the military government of Egypt, they're working together with Israel to impose the siege on Gaza. Even the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, Of Egypt. Okay, to repeat, you know, even East, uh, Egypt under the Muslim Brotherhood was not lifting the siege on Gaza, so they could not import, you know, explosives, you know, because the government of Gaza was Hamas and Hamas had quit the Muslim Brotherhood, so they were at odds with each other. <laughs> so there's yeah. no explosives, you know, in Gaza to put into, you know, rockets to send, you know, into Israel. They, there are no expl explosive charges, you know, they couldn't kill anybody. So, you know, I will like, say, um, there, there was a lot more questions on the sheet, but um, given the, the time that this is running, I think we will um, cut down the questions to like uh, maybe one more, which is, you've, uh, you've recently uh, disassociated with the Trotskyist movement, uh, largely, but um, yes, in... In that, I'm not necessarily asking you to go into detail with that. Rather, I would uh, ask you to go into detail with your uh, largest critiques of Marxism, and uh, I'll have uh, some commentary on that as well. Hmm. Um, the recent uh, uh, war in the Ukraine has caused a uh, a division, you know, within the Trotskyist movement. You know, like I've broken from the Trotskyist movement organizationally since a long time. Um, and from the Trotskyists themselves, you know, I've, I've remained in contact. I've regained, you know, my subscription to Marx Mail, where the Trotskyists are, are, are the majority force, uh, together with some ex peers. Um, and there, you know, a majority of the Trotskyists, you know, are taking a position in favor of NATO. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Why? Because, you know, they're supporting the sovereignty of the Ukraine. What does sovereignty mean? It means, you know, uh, the nation state, you know, boundaries, frontiers, you know, of a given state that are claimed for itself under the principle of self-determination. And uh, you, even while denying the right of self-determination, the very same right, you know, to the Donetsk and Lugansk, you know, national minorities there who are Russian speaking in the Ukraine. Uh, so, you know, these Trotskyists, you know, have decided to support, you know, the Ukraine and NATO against, you know, the uh, national liberation struggles, you know, of the Donetsk uh, People's Autonomous Republic and Lugansk mm -hmm. People's Autonomous Republic and their militias, which, you know, initiated the uh, the resistance, you know, after the, the um, 2014 uh, Medanic, you know, uh, coup d'etat in uh, Kiev. Yeah. So, you know, Russia's helping them, helping to liberate them now, which is excellent, you know, and that's what I consider to be the revolutionary dynamic in this case. But these Trotskyists, you know, are supporting, you know, NATO and showing how good, you know, like, uh, they are, you know, the goody rat libs, you know, type thing. Now, this is very similar to a tendency that existed, you know, in the Fourth International at the time of the um, uh, Molotov-Rubentrop uh, Pact, in which uh, the uh, USSR made a pact with, uh, with uh, Nazi Germany to avoid, you know, hostilities and provide, you know, Nazi Germany, you know, with... Uh, with food for their soldiers, training facilities, and even uh, uh, parachute classes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, these uh, you know members of the Fourth International at that time said, "Wow, this is too much." You know, like Russia can no longer be considered, you know, a worker state, and and is now considered to be a a, a counter revolutionary imperialist entity. And so uh, they were led by Schachtman, and the Schachtman. Uh, uh, split from the fourth and their faction, the Shachmanites, uh, in effect supported NATO. They began to support NATO in the United States um, State Department, and and they they, and they seeded you know the ideas which uh, gave rise to the neocons, which arose you know in, in terms of political theory uh, by way of the Shachmanite Trotskyists. Now, so here they're duplicating the same process you know which led to the downfall of the Fourth International. Yeah. So I, I denounced them, you know, in the group. And all of a sudden, you know, I was no longer receiving any, you know, postings from the group because uh, uh, somebody, my email address was bouncing and, and cut me off. But I corrected that and I'm back in there and, and mouthing off again. I will have to say that uh, 
to the most of ribbon shop packs whilst an era there were other packs made by the USSR that were anti-fascist before and after that packs now this doesn't excuse the USSR from blame for what they did but just for clarification purposes I do have to say that this that the the pact wasn't you know that the 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 USSR were not consistent in supporting Nazis yes uh, there was a pact in extremis you know like it was under extreme con conditions you know because uh, uh, Britain uh, Poland and France had all made pacts with Nazi Germany already so they were mm. going to they wanted to sacrifice as many they wanted to encourage Nazi Germany to attack the Soviet Union and not to attack France and Britain yeah so you know so that's you know one analysis you know which is legitimate you know of the of the, the of that pact but these Trotskyists went further not only the criticizing the pact but they abandoned the Soviet Union and they turned against the Soviet Union in support of NATO so that's you know uh, what the uh, scandal is, you know, of these uh, of these former Trotskyists, the Shachmanites, and now a majority of the Trotskyists are doing the same in support of I, NATO against. You were, yes. I do. The sovereignty of the Donetsk and Lugansk people is necessary in terms of the right of self determination. The only concern I do have is the. Um, is the the war having spread to Kiev and mostly it's not even necessarily uh, my concern over Ukraine it's the concern over um, uh, Russian Polish relations going on now because I do fear um, what would happen if Russian and Polish relations get worse oh yeah Russian Polish relations have always been problematic you know ever since uh, Lenin ordered the uh, Red Army's advance into Poland Trotsky was opposed to this but he went through it anyway and they ended up being defeated. That was the first defeat of the Red Army. And uh, it was over a political disagreement between Lenin and Trotsky there. Yeah. But uh, uh, what uh, I have to say about Marxism in general, considering the, uh, the failures of the First International, the Second International, the Third International, and the Fourth International, which were all based upon the nation state as a organizational format, giving rise to a centralized political party in each of those nation states who were the uh, official sections of the internationals in all four cases. And this is an organizational problem because it is in contradiction with internationalism and internationalism in the sense that you put a hyphen between inter and national because the international should be relations between nations, but international has been a term used by the Marxists internationals to mean the negation of the nation and that you would have a centralized authority, you know, the head of the international, which would dictate to all the national sections. So this is uh, the opposite of, you know, national self-determination. And yet it was the principle by which the internationals were operating in which so this is, you know, my word, you know, on, on Marxism in general, as to I, initiate a sort of an analysis. My main, uh, my main uh, argument against that would be the um, modern philosophy of Maoism, uh, which generally, if you look into their, um, into the work, the um, the Naxalite, um, the Naxalite forces are part of the Indian Maoist movement, being recognised by um, Mao when he was alive as well as um, the, the Indian Communist Party, has helped them resist um, certain forces, forcing them off their land, as well as generally uh, persecuting them. In uh, Peru, the, the indigenous communities of Peru were heavily involved in the, the PCP uh, SL. Um, and the, mm -hmm. there are many notable other examples of um, more indigenous communities being able to um, take up... Um, take up uh, political status and being able to and sometimes being very prominent if not main forces of the revolution as in the case of peru uh, of the indigenous people of peru being the main uh, fighting force of that revolution mm. uh, 
there's an opportunity today to let on a new company. So this oh. is an interesting process as well. And it seems to be a furthering of the revolutionary process into domain, you know, which is rarely touched upon. Nicaragua had a constitutional revolution as well, a referendum mm -hmm. on a new constitutional revolutionary constitution. And now it's happening in Chile. And it also happened in Tunisia, except the constitution has been suspended by, um, you know, some dictator now who's being uh, in the process of being overthrown. So that Tunisia will return to its constitutional foundations. But this is an essential process. And it was a, an essential process that was negated, you know, by the Bolshevik party under Lenin, actually, you know, in 1917, when the Constituent Assembly was, was shut down because the majority of the delegates that were elected at one point, you know, came from the Social Revolutionary Party. So it wasn't the Communist Party. So, you know, the Bolsheviks, you know, shut it down. They promised, you know, to hold a new election, but never did. And then the Soviets were shut down in 1926 because the communist parties, you know, achieved a majority you know, in, the, in the most of the Soviets. And so they said, you know, why bother with the Soviets? It's the communist party that's ruling anyway. So, you know, the, the whole process degenerated, you know, from earlier on. So I'd say there was like seven years of a revolutionary process in the uh, Russian Bol Bolshevik revolution. But it remained, you know, a worker state until 1991, as far as I'm concerned. That that needed to be supported, you know, and uh, furthered in its you know internal revolutionary process, but it never succeeded. Seeing, so as, I, new seeing as I have the um, I have the mouse perspective, I obviously have a slightly different view. Seeing as the Sino-Soviet split and all the the details that happened there, but um, I would say that the the um, especially the innovations in China with the people's councils as well as the um, principle of the mass line, I think that did sort of help mitigate a lot of the chauvinism in former communist parties. Um, I have uh, arguments about the um, periods after the Soviets were abolished because there, because there was a lot of political maneuvering at that time so i'm not surprised by the move that they made now we can argue over whether it was right for them to do that but i'm i don't really necessarily care about the ethics of the communist party that is no longer here and mm -hmm. if you look at the the russian communist party as it is today it is no longer there um mm -hmm. but um mm -hmm. in that i think the principle of the mass line as well as the principle of making sure that people from oppressed groups uh, have their not only their representation but have the role that they should in the revolution especially mm. in indigenous communities is a vital lesson that was learned by the experiences of the people's wars of the 20th century mm -hmm. the mao's communist party was different uh, than the russian communist party you know there's yeah. there's much more dynamic you know there's much more you know, different factions and different periods, you know, with different policies that were implemented over the history of the Communist Party rule there. Uh, so, you know, it's something to be examined. And and also the Communist Party under Mao, you know, initiated, you know, a cultural revolution, which had yeah. different aspects to it. You know? But I studied a lot of it, you know, with the documents that were translated by the British Embassy in Hong Kong. And it was uh, very interesting. And Shanghai Commune was a very important model there, you know, which I hope will inspire, you know, further developments. I hope if you've still got any of that documentation, I could uh, help publish it because, um, especially once mm -hmm. we make the website, it'd be it'd be useful to have some of that information archived. But it's um, it's been a pleasure, Doctor. So uh, if there's anything else you want to add, I'm I'm fine with that. But um, I think we've covered a lot of ground today, and if we ever, want, I'd be happy to bring you on again to the channel. But it, it's been great, Doctor. Yes, I'm very pleased with all the, you know, uh, aspects that we've covered here. You know, it's very, been very intense. You know, thanks for doing this. Yeah, it's always a pleasure. I've been meaning to for months now. It's just uh, <laughs> there's a lot of plans that get in the way. But I'm, I'm glad that yeah. we finally managed to cover it. So um, this has been The Angles List with Dr. Weisfeld, and we are signing out.